All right, I've got an example of magnetic forces. So suppose the charged particle of mass 2 kilograms and charge 1 coulomb starts at the origin with velocity 3 meters per second in the y direction and travels in a region of uniform magnetic field B, um, which is 10 webers per square meter in the z direction. So I've got parts A, B, C, D, E there, and so we're going to start with A, find the velocity and acceleration of the object. I really like this example because it ties in a lot of concepts from physics. We're going to need a lot of physics here. All right, so part A, find the velocity and acceleration of the object. So from physics, we need the, we need the magnetic force. We need the force on this thing to be able to do that. So recall that the magnetic force, right, which is the subject of this video, oddly enough, is Q times the velocity cross magnetic field B like that. All right. And uh, this is actually a differential equation if you think about it because on the left force is mass times acceleration and acceleration is the derivative of velocity which we're trying to find. So we have the derivative of velocity on the left and we have velocity on the right. So that's going to be a differential equation and because this is a three-dimensional problem, right, x, y, z, this is actually coupled or uh, a coupled um, system of three differential equations, one in the x direction, one in the y, and one in the z direction. So let's compute this cross product, and q happens to be one coulomb, so I'm just not even going to write q here. And this would be ax, ay, az. You should be very comfortable on cross products at this point. Now I'm going to put, um, we don't know what the velocity is, so I'm just going to say, well, it's got an x component, it's got a y component, it's got a z component like this, u, u, x, u, y, u, z, and then the magnetic field is 0, 0, 0010 webers per square meter, and I compute that cross product. I'm not going to show the details of the cross product because you should know um, how to compute a cross product by this point in the course. So when I compute that cross product, I get this. And remember there's a 1 coulomb which changes the units to newtons there. All right, so remember again that the magnetic force then is mass times acceleration, and acceleration is the derivative of um, the velocity. So we could write that this cross product, or you know, the result from that cross product is actually mass times du dt, like that. Okay, now I'm gonna come up here to the top right to try to save some space. And uh, we've got we've got mass times um, du dt, and I can divide by mass, which ha happens to be two kilograms in this problem. So what I have essentially is du dt is equal to five uy ax minus five ux ay, like that. Okay, and this is now meters per second squared because we divided by two kilograms. Now, so again, we've got three differential equations here written compactly in vector notation. So if I consider first the x direction, then on the left I've got dux dt is equal to 5 uy. So I'm just comparing uh, the x coord or the x components with one another. So on the left, dux dt, and on the right, the x component is 5uy. And then similarly, duy dt is equal to negative 5ux, right? And duz dt is equal to 0 because there's no um, component in the z direction over here. Okay, so I have to solve these equations, and nicely, this third equation, right, if I have the derivative of something equals zero, then I know that that something is a constant. And I'm going to represent that constant by C0, all right, and we'll have to come back to that and figure out what that C0 is. Now, for these two guys, they're, kind of, they're coupled. 
which means that they're related to one another. If I have the derivative of ux is equal to you know something uy, and then over here I have the derivative of uy is equal to something ux, those are coupled. And so one way of solving this is to take the derivative again of one of these two. So if I take the derivative of this guy here, dux dt, uh, both sides, I will have d squared ux dt squared, like this, is 5 duy dt, right? And so now oh, I have duy dt, I have it, it's negative 5 ux. So if I, if I consider this to be negative 5 ux, then what I get here is negative 25 ux. So now if I just look at the left, at the very left of that equation and the very right of that equation, now I have one variable in ux, right? And so I can kind of uh, just manipulate this a little bit. I have d squared ux over dt squared and bring the 25 over. So this is 25 ux equals 0. Awesome. So now this is a very special differential equation that you should have studied uh, in math class. And um, if ux were a position instead of a velocity or a speed, then this would be simple harmonic motion. The solution to this is sines and cosines. So I'm not going to solve that for you. I'm not going to show, show why that is. I trust that you have had differential equations. Okay, and I'm just going to tell you the solution to that. The solution to this thing is ux is equal to some constant times cosine of 5t plus some constant times sine of 5t. Right, that's the solution that's in meters per second. And um, where does the 5 come from? Well, the 5 is the square root of this number. So this number is 25. That's the frequency squared. So we take the square root of that. that that's our frequency. This is a 5 over here. It kind of looks like a 3. Okay, and uh, the co coefficients c1 and c2 we have to determine. So I'm not going to show you why that is, but I'll encourage you to put that solution back into the differential equation and uh, convince yourself that that is the solution. Okay, so now we know that 5uy is the derivative of ux. Okay, so we can actually use that now and we can get uy. Right, so uy then, so if I take the derivative of this thing and divide by 5, then I get negative c1 because the derivative of cosine is negative sine of 5t, like that, plus c2 cosine of 5t meters per second. So again, that's vy, so I use this equation here to get that. So I took the derivative changing the sines to cosines and the negative and so forth. And then by the chain rule, you have to multiply by 5, but then I ended up dividing by 5 to get Vy. So there we go. Okay, so now I need to get the, uh, I'm going to get the, uh, the coefficients over here. So we're going to plug in the initial conditions. So at time t equals 0, okay, I know that my initial velocity is uh, 3 meters per second in the y direction. So I, I know then, let, let me plug in um, t equals 0 into vx. So when I do that, I get the cosine of 0, which is 1. So I just get c1, right? And the sine of 0 is 0. So, so c1 is what I get out of that equation. And that's the initial speed in the x direction. And so that should be 0 because I don't have an initial velocity in the x direction. So I get 0 there. And then I'll, I'll just put a semicolon. Then let me get c2. But let me plug in um, 0 into the vy equation. So we've got um, sine of 0 is 0. And then cosine of 0 is 1. So I get c2 equals the initial velocity in the y direction, which is 3 meters per second. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say 3 right there. And then finally, what about the z direction? So what about this co this constant c0? Okay, when I plug in 0, well there is no t, right? It's just constant. So c0 must be the initial z velocity in which is 0. Okay, so now I've got the velocity. I've got I've got it fully specified. The velocity is 3 
sine of 5t in the x direction, right? So that comes from this, right? C1 is 0, so I just have the sine part. Then for the y direction, uh, I've got the cosine, so this is plus 3 cosine of 5t in the y direction, and then in the z we have 0, and so this is this is it. That is the velocity of this object. Okay, so now once we get the velocity of the object, well, the acceleration is, is straightforward. This acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. So I take the derivative of this guy. So uh, the sine turns into a cosine, and I need to multiply by 5 from the chain rule. So this is 15 cosine 5t in the x direction. And then uh, for the cosine, the cosine turns into a negative sine. I need to multiply by 5 minus 5 sine of 5t in the y direction. Meters per second squared. Beautiful. So that's my acceleration. All right, so that's the end of part A. And I'm going to erase. I think I can erase some of this. Hopefully. OK. So let's move on now. So we're going to go to part B, calculate the magnetic force on this guy. So that's that's pretty simple. Once I have, um, well, I actually, I've done I've done the cross product, right? So um, I just I just need to compute this cross product. I have vx, vy, and v. Uh, excuse me, ux, uy, and uz. That's th this thing here. Okay, so I just have to compute that cross product. No big deal. Right, so this is uh, this is magnetic force equals Q times U cross B. Okay, so again Q is one coulomb. So now this just uh, this just reduces to again A X, A Y, A Z. Okay, so then I put. I put velocity next, so the x component is 3 sine of 5t. The, the y component is 3 cosine of 5t. And there is no z component, 0. And then uh, the magnetic field is 0, 0, 10. Right? And again, you should know how to compute these cross products. You should be expert at that. So this, uh, I'm not going to show the details. This gives me 30 cosine of 5t ax minus 30 sine of 5t ay, and that's in newtons. All right, and so that's the answer to part b. OK, now let's consider c, determine the object's kinetic energy. So. Uh, you should know from physics that kinetic energy is ma one half mass times the speed of the object squared, and the speed of the object is the magnitude of the velocity. Right? So, what's the magnitude of the velocity? Well, we have one half times two kilograms, right? And the 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 magnitude of the velocity is simply the uh, the square root of these two things squared, right? So let's do that. So I take the square root of those two things squared. So that gives me. Oh, and then I and then I square it. So actually, I don't even need the square root. So this gives me nine sine squared five t, right? Plus nine cosine squared five t. So that's the square of the speed right there. And I can factor out a 9. So this would be 9 times sine squared 5t plus cosine squared of 5t. And what is sine squared of 5t plus cosine squared of 5t? That's just 1. And so this turns out to be 9 joules. 
And I like this result because this result shows you that the kinetic energy is independent of time. The time dropped out. And why is that? Well, the magnetic force is um, perpendicular to the movement of this thing. It's perpendicular to the velocity. And so um, whenever a force is perpendicular to the velocity or to the movement, um, remember that the work or the energy imparted on that object is the dot product of force with the, the displacement. And so when you do the dot product of that and you get that perpendicular action, then uh, the dot product is zero. All of that is to say is that the magnetic force imp imparts no energy on the object, so it does not change the energy of the object. And so the kinetic energy stays at 9 joules for all time. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to erase uh, what we've just done there. Hopefully we don't need that, but we'll see. All right, so D, we're going to find the object's position at time t equals 4 seconds. Okay, so some of this will look familiar to what we've already done. Let me erase that. Okay, so we have the velocity now, and we know that the derivative of position, so position r, is equal to velocity, right? The, the derivative of the position is the velocity. So that's going to be 3 sine of 5t ax plus 3 cosine of 5t ay, like that. And uh, we're going to do something very similar to what, when we solved for, for, for the velocity and for the acceleration. So what we're going to do is um, compare component by component. So on the left we have drx, so the x component of the position, is going to be equal to 3 sine of 5t, like that. And the derivative of the y component of position is 3 cosine of 5t, like that, and the derivative of the z component of the position is equal to 0 because there's no, z, there's no component here. Okay, so we need to solve these differential equations. Okay, that's no big deal. Notice that, again, I have the derivative of something equals 0, so that something is going to be a constant that we have to solve for. So I'm going to call that constant C5. Okay, now they're not coupled. These two remaining equations are not coupled, so this is actually easier to solve. Notice that uh, Ry does not um, come up in this equation, and Rx does not come up in this equation, so they, they are um, independent of one another. So when I integrate Rx, okay, when I integrate this first equation, so the integral of that guy, then I see that I get negative 3 over 5 cosine of 5t plus some constant. I'll call that constant c3. And just as a sanity check, I'll take the derivative of this and see if I get back 3 sine of 5t. So I take the derivative of cosine 5t, that turns into a negative sine. 5 comes out, cancels with that 5. Negatives cancel, I get 3 sine of 5t. Derivative of constant is 0, and I get back this thing. Okay, similarly, I can integrate the second equation there for ry, and I get ry is 3 fifths sine of 5t plus some constant c4, right? So I got to get these constants uh, c3, c4, c5. The way I do that is with the information that this thing starts at the origin, so we have its initial position. So at time t equals 0, I should get 0, 0, 0, right? And so if I plug that plug in time t equals 0 to rx, I get cosine of 0, so I've get, I get uh, rx is 0, right, because it's, we start at the origin, 0 equals negative 3 fifths plus c3, and so that means that c3 is 3 fifths. And, uh, and then if I plug t equals 0 into ry, I get sine of 0, sine of 0 is 0, so this must be that c4 is equal to 0, and then um, when I plug it into uh, this constant, I must have C5 equal to 0. So there are my constants. 
no big deal there. And so then uh, I know the position of this thing, so I'm ru running out of space. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write the position here. So the position is negative 3 fifths cosine of 5t uh, plus c3, so plus 3 fifths. All of that in the x direction. Then uh, 3 fifths sine of 5t. in the y direction. Okay, and then the z direction is zero. So that's my position for all of time, right? And so then if I want at t equals four seconds, all I do is plug in um, t equals to four into into this guy. So I would have the cosine of 20 there and the sine of 20. And so what I get, what I find is that r at t equals four seconds is 0 0.355 ax plus 0 0.548 ay and that's meters so that is the initial or that is the position at time t equals 4 seconds okay finally we're going to determine the trajectory of this thing by eliminating t so we have the position now we have the position for all time that's this guy and now we're going to try to, so we've got an x component, we've got a y component. So it's only moving then um, in the x direction and in the y direction, not in the z direction. So we wonder what path is that following then? So we're going to try to, we're going to, try to solve um, our y, we're going to find the relationship between our y and our x, and we're going to get rid of time. So let's do that. This will make sense once we, once we start doing it. Just gonna race, race what we don't need, and uh, I only think we need that position there. Okay, and I'm gonna move that position up here. Okay, so this is part E. Find the trajectory of this thing. All right, so we know from the previous part that Rx is 3 fifths minus 3 fifths cosine of 5t. So you tell me what time it is and I'll tell you exactly where the the object is located on the x direction on the x-axis and then uh, we also know for the y coordinate its position is given by 3 fifths sine of 5t like that. Okay, and then notice from the first equation that I wrote there that we could rewrite this as 5 thirds rx minus 1 is equal to the cosine of 5t. Okay, and the reason I'm solving that for, for, for t essentially is because I want to get rid of the t, so I want to find the relationship between ry and rx. So now I can draw this handy dandy triangle and we're going to call this angle 5t. Okay, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So we can we can say then that this is the adjacent side, 5 thirds rx minus 1, and call the hypotenuse 1. And so in that case, this thing from Pythagorean theorem, this side is 1 minus 5 thirds rx minus 1 squared. Right, so feel free to pause the video, check that calculation, uh, but that's from Pythagorean theorem. So then sine of 5t, sine of 5t, because I'm interested in that as well, because I have that in the ry equation, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So that would just be 1, the square root of 1 minus 5 thirds rx minus 1 squared. Okay, so we've done a similar trick with these triangles uh, when we've used some trigonometric substitution for integration. All right, so now let's go back to Ry. Ry was 3 fifths times the sine of 5t, but here's the sine of 5t, right? So this is the 
this guy. So notice, right, we've already started to eliminate time from our equation. That's what we were trying to do. So, um, so now, again, to just summarize, we took our x and we, we made this triangle and we related the cosine with the sine. And so essentially we brought our x, we substituted in for t. And so now we have a relationship between our y and our x that does not depend on t. All right, so now I just need to kind of put this in a nice form. Um, notice that I can, I can square both sides. So that's nice. That makes 9 25ths there. And then times... 1 minus 5 thirds rx minus 1 squared, like that. And then uh, I can foil that out and, and put it in a nice form, and then uh, you'd see that I would have rx squared, or minus rx squared, plus 6 fifths rx, like that. Okay, so now what we can do is uh, add everything to the other side. So I'll put, I'll do that, that's ry squared plus rx squared plus 6 fifths rx, oh that should be minus, minus 6 fifths rx equals 0, right, like that. And then here's the trick, you can complete the square. So I, I won't show those, those gory details there, but we've got the ry, and here with the rx, I'm going to complete the square. Basically, if you don't remember, you take this linear term, you divide it by 2, and, uh, and then that's what you square. So I've got rx, so that thing divided by 2 would be 3 fifths, so rx minus 3 fifths, so that quantity squared, and then I have to subtract 9 20 fifths. So that's, that's all completing the square there. That's grade school algebra. Okay, so there's my uh, trajectory. Um, if I want to put it in just a little bit different form, let me get the constant over to the other side, and let me just write, the, write it as 3 fifths squared. So here's my trajectory. And if I were to plot it, what would it look like? Here's y, here's x. Here are the, the x component is related to the y component like this. So this is a circle. This is a circle centered at 3 fifths comma 0 with radius 3 fifths. So the object keeps going like this. And uh, that's great. That's cool. Why, why does it do that? You know, why does it keep going in a circle? And again, that's due to the fact that the force, the magnetic force, is perpendicular to the motion. So whenever you have a force that's perpendicular to the motion, you have an orbit.